Welcome to the NY Patriot Show. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and hitting that play button or catching it live. Uh, if this is your first time coming across this channel, you happen to luck out. I have an amazing, amazing guest on. Uh, if this is your, if you're coming back and checking it out again, if you're a return listener, you already know who this man is. I've had him on before, and I think everybody listens to my show knows who he is anyway. Uh, and today I'm also accompanied by my amazing. Co- Canadian co-host Teresa. So Teresa, you want to say what's up real quick before? Yes, I introduce, uh, thank William? you for having me. It's a nice introduction. <laughs> and today, if you didn't see it already, because it's already in the title, we have the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, William Ramsey, on with us today. Uh, somebody that whenever I've had him on, it's just always good talks. Uh, I've said it before, and uh, not to guess his head up. I this man helped me get out of the OTO in a way. Believe it or not. So I, I just always, it's always a gift to me to literally have William Ramsey on my show because it blows my mind that the guy who got me to wake up to the OTO is now on my show. It's just, it's mind blowing. So I, I'm always excited to have him on and it's always just a great guest. I mean, it's going to bring tons of info, you know? So uh, William, in case nobody knows who you are on my show already, can you at least plug yourself and let him know where to find you? Sure. Thanks for having me again, Nick. It's great to talk with you and Teresa and I am William Ramsey. I basically became kind of an investigative journalist. I really started writing books. My first book was published in 2010. And then I just kind of morphed. I kind of turned into being on a lot of shows. I tried to self-promote. I self-published. And then I worked with Ed Opperman on the Opperman Report for about three years. I remember that. That was a while ago, right? Yeah, so I I kind of, he actually... Train like I did a service for him, but he actually trained me. He actually, uh, it was kind of like, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of interesting because I just learned the ropes. I learned how to contact people and get them scheduled. And I made those mistakes. A lot of the mistakes I made was working as a producer for Ed, getting time zones figured out, dates, rescheduling, all this stuff. So <laughs> you can see a lot of my shows are on the Ed Opperman report. And I interviewed with uh, people like. Oh, just tons of other different people. Uh, yeah. But uh, then I kind of started my own podcast. I still publish books. So I've got five books, five uh, documentaries. I made some documentaries over kind of the COVID time. And then I'm at over 800 episodes now on my podcast, William Ramsey Investigates, which you can check out at iTunes or Spotify. I signed a contract with Spotify. And nice. I had over 1.7 million downloads last year uh, on that podcast. So it was, it was in the top 1%. So people were listening, and that's kind of why I know a lot about JFK because I've interviewed a lot of people. I sent out that list to you and published it on my social media, kind of all the interviews I've done over time on the subject. So I've become, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I've, I've had sure experts. You say more than I can. <laughs> so I, and then, like you were talking in the pre-show, we kind of synced up about Lansdale. I had yeah. a guest on last week or two weeks ago who covered Lansdale's kind of – schemes and things. The uh, he was literally known as the ugly American <laughs> overseas in the Philippines and in Vietnam. Oh, uh, the disaster of the Vietnam War. So um so anyway, so that's kind of like my background and kind of what I know about JFK. I've not, I've done, interviewed a lot of different authors and a lot of uh one was a actually a documentary uh was made in 2022. It was called The Assassination of Miss Payne. Really fascinating. I've been to Miss Payne's house too in Irving, Texas. So I actually took pictures of that. It's on my social media. And it was actually bought by the city of Irving. So she was a central character in this whole thing because she was uh, living with Marina Oswald. But she also very suspiciously, like, went to East, hung out on some secret island of the uh, WASP elite Brahmins, then drove back and picked up Oswald in New Orleans and drove him to Irving, Texas. And then his wife stayed with her, and he it was in a kind of a halfway house under a fake name. So really, and got him his job at the school book depository. Uh, they found so she had the testimony of his wall of his information about the rifle in her garage, supposedly, and she has an interesting background too. So that's just one. There's a very strange, high weirdness all around the killing of Kennedy too, and she's one part of it. So. 
You know, one thing I do just want to add real quick, if there's somebody who's coming across this show who really doesn't know who you are, actually, uh, I do highly suggest to go check out his stuff for the, the JFK and, and besides that, West, Men's, West Memphis 3, Smiley Face Killers, Alistair Crowley, all amazing work done by this guy. If you've not heard that stuff, please shut this off and go check that out and come back. You know, like for well, it's real. interesting <laughs> to say that because I'm like arguing with these people about the smiley face on my social media. And then they say, can you explain this to me again? I'm like, again? Oh, no. I'm like, oh, oh no. Oh, After one, so watching so one of your dead. shows. I've done so many shows and, and, you, shows and two documentaries. Sean. I'm like, I got to explain this again. Yeah. It's kind of like Groundhog Day. I had to interview somebody who wanted to interview me about Abomination, and I've been doing those shows for 10 years. Oh. And she, she didn't know, like, some of the key stuff that I've said. Like, I just had to go over it again and again. I was like, oh, man, I guess this is... Yeah. This is my curse. This is what I have to do. But whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's your calling in life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I chose it. I could have backed out, right? So, there you I go. guess this, that's true. Uh, this is the path I've taken. And, you, you know, you did mention uh, earlier, which I, I thought was actually really weird. I was telling you before we started. Uh, there's a listener, uh, a, f- a fan, Denise. Um, I've had her on my show before. I know she, I think she's been on other shows. And uh, she was telling me, um, actually, she had come across, I was asking her, are you going to come on my show again? Because she's done a couple of topics. And she mentioned Lansdale and then sent me the link of uh, a few days later of you covering Lansdale. And then I sent her a picture of me rendering my video of me making an episode for Lansdale. And I was like, what's going on? Because, <laughs> like, it was just seemed, like, really weird how, like, all three of us all, like, were kind of digging into that guy at the same time. And I did mention in the video that I put out, he was mentioned maybe something to do with the JFK assassination. I didn't go into that because I knew that that could be just a whole other rabbit hole. I wanted it to be a short that was going to make it a long, you know. So just adding that in wasn't going to be. Uh, I just didn't think it was going to be you know worth it. And uh, so I, I do know like we had up on the screen before, and I'll, I'll add it again. Um, that is supposedly him, possibly uh, during the time of I guess JFK's assassination. But if you could, uh, William, maybe give us a little bit about like the how's his name even come into it. Your opinion from what you've it's said. a good question. Like I heard his name in the JFK movie by Oliver Stone, oh, but his name yeah. popped in because somebody saw him and somebody who knew him said, Hey, that's him. The gate, the ring on the finger, the oversized ring and the size and the hair, the hair, the kind of uh, haircut that he had, he was military. So he kind of kept the same kind of short haircut. Yeah. Um, and some of these pictures that have been found are really remarkable. Like uh, I interviewed this guy, Corey Hughes about the two Oswalds. We cover. He's a JFK researcher, but he had pictures of some of these other characters around the assassination that I'd never seen before. So some of these were clearly covered up, just like the mm. Zapruder film. But Lansdale was mentioned there. But Lansdale was kind of like an infantryman of the post World War II American Empire. The aspect of America getting involved in all of these other countries and manipulating them, whether it's Honduras, Iran, um, Iraq meddling in Lebanon, uh, Indonesia, just everywhere, Italy, Australian oh, really? elections, just all over the place. So he was kind of like the guy who was in post-war in the Philippines, and he was uh, kind of like the Sven Gali or kind of a black pope or something of of this Magsaysay who fought against the uh, Japanese empire. So he kind of put Magsaysay into power supposedly. And then yeah, he was always in the military. I have a picture of him too. A very interesting picture. Let me see if I can pull this up, but it's of him with Alan Dulles, who was also kind of, you know, the head of the CIA head of MK ultra at one point. Yeah. When I uh, covered him, the stuff that I came across, if it was all truthful, you know, they, uh, from what I got out of it, he basically helped, like they helped remove that president. And then they pretty much wrote his, uh, Wrote everything for Magsaysay, I think, uh, Lansdale, supposedly. You know, like, he even wrote his up. speeches and even threatened him. If you don't do what I want you to do, I'm going to beat you up or something silly like that. I think they even I had physical so. threats. He was, puppeteered. he was puppeteered by the American Empire. I think, I think at that's... one point, in, even in Magsaysay's speeches, at one point, he might have even almost said that, like, I'm pretty much, like, totally with America. Like, he was almost, like, blatant about it. Right, I think that's the case. So I think that he was just a puppet. He was, yeah. he was a put in his puppet. And a lot of these guys were, they were, oh, the old ones were overthrown and new puppets were put in that were sympathetic to the U S and Mag Sese was one of them. He wasn't even a natural politician. He was a guerrilla fighter. It's really what he was. 
And so Lansdale was involved in all of these, but he was really kind of the, the one of the first guys to formulate military psychological operations. Yeah, so was, like black was, ops and that yeah. stuff. So that's kind of what he was. He was that type of person, not a desk guy, but somebody going out. There's a famous story of him. He was up against con- communist guerrillas and they were superstitious. So they believed in this vampire. So they would abduct them like uh, somebody from one of their you know troops and then drain all their blood and put two prongs into their neck and leave it out there to scare the living daylights out of them. So that's one thing he did. So he knew that. And then when we got in Vietnam, involved in Vietnam in the sixties, he was involved in operation Phoenix, which was just grotesque level, you know, like uh, all kinds of dark stuff. They did, they did all kinds of intimidation. And things <laughs> Is that like the that. one with the, um, they would like fly over planes and they were actually like playing stuff over the loudspeakers. Yeah, loudspeakers, yeah, the whole the thing. Painting you know, eyes like, on people's houses if they were like letting the hucks in or if they're harboring them. But you know, yeah. you know what you mentioned before, and it's something I have actually like. You know, if you really think about it, the whole vampire thing. Regardless, if somebody was to believe that was a vampire, wouldn't that just kind of uh-huh. scare you? Regardless, yeah. like it's a dead person anyway. <laughs> like, uh, regardless, yeah. it it. <laughs> like how can you have the power to do it? But the, uh, I, that I just thought was crazy is that if people like he he looked into their mythology or their weird beliefs and literally used how to learn it, it use it against them. I mean, he had right. people possibly believing there was vampires out there. That's that's impressive. I hate to say it, but that's. Wow. Yeah, I think he was a remarkable guy. I mean, I think that they, he was sent by Dulles and his brother, right? So Dulles was the head of uh, the CIA, and then his brother was the Secretary of State, right? And so they were sent, he was sent knowingly, like, I'm sending one of my best guys to the Philippines to handle this. So he was considered by these, like, high-level people. Dulles was a incredible character and a very important figure in the JFK beginning all the way through the sixties. I think he, his name kind of pops up in uncomfortable places and he, his like Helms was really kind of his uh, choice to become follow him as the head of the CIA, which happened. So, and yeah, I think it's important to look at JFK and Lansdale and these people in the context of history, not just the event of what happened in November 22, 1963, but what led up to it, what happened after very important, what JFK was really up against with these all, these guys like Lansdale and Dulles who had been overthrowing countries for years. And I did a, a, an interview with a guy, Walter Herbst. You can, you can check that those interviews out or look at his books. I recommend his books. Uh, but it was, uh, did, did, did not start with JFK. So the decades of events that led to the assassination. So he goes in the background of Dulles and they're kind of the American empire that started after world war two. There really wasn't a competitor. Russia was a fake competitor in my mind. They were, but they were devastated by the invasion. They were not ready to fight anymore. And they were created as a, a beneficial adversary for the advance of the American empire. They were a good bogeyman. I would call them the Goldstein of the post-war era. Um, and, and they still are actually, they're still great. Uh, they're still using the Russians as the enemy to promote their, International. Yeah, every agenda. ten or twenty years, it's always good to circle back to the Russians. They're always good. Right? You got to keep <laughs> them in your back the pocket. <laughs> look, at, look at Hunter Biden blaming the Russian disinformation. I mean, they, the government, the U.S. government was state. I mean, this Twitter files is not really on the subject, but they were using this fake Russian stuff as an excuse to cover up their own criminal behavior, right? So they've been using Russia, and so Dole's brothers did that as well. I mean, so and the communist was always a boogeyman. Um, I think that I'm not a great, I'm not pro communist, but they used this to further the American uh, rapacious global uh, corporate uh, fascism. You could call it fascism. I think that's fair. Is is to loot really all these governments and these countries with as much of their natural resources as possible. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. Oil. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. there's another thing that uh, I think he did. Uh... I can't, I might be confused. I think it might've been in Vietnam. And, and I took this as actually kind of impressive too. Didn't he get like half or like 55% or I think it was either the Catholics or the Christians to actually move. I think it was like to, they moved, he ended up getting them to move into somewhere else. Literally getting them convinced that Jesus had moved and Mary had like. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. So I don't yeah. know that. Operation Phoenix. I've had a uh, Valentine on a long time ago, but I don't really, I don't, I didn't get to that part of when I did that interview with the, 
the guy for uh, things observed, it was really just about him and, and uh, the Philippines. So I looked into all that pre-Vietnam stuff, but nothing would surprise me. There are the Southern Vietnamese, the people who were propped up were um, Vietnamese Catholics and the rest of the country was Buddhist. So they were in a minority. So a lot of those guys actually emigrated to the U S so you'll see spots of these guys who had to leave after I think it was uh, the guy who was assassinated right before um, Kennedy. Like, I think the guy who was assassinated was one of the brothers there who ran the show and then Kennedy was gone too. So it's important to see those in the in context. I forgot his name offhand. Oh, real quick. I could say it's Operation Passage to Freedom where he assisted in like moving 310,000 Vietnamese civilians from uh, communist North Vietnam to non-communist South Vietnam. But he got Child. them to leave, like with like telling them that Jesus had said <laughs> to, to leave, and what? that Mary had actually left and gone to there. That's a lot like, of people. Wow, yeah, and yeah, that's dangerous when you can, you know. And that's what I, I was saying this to Jack, and this is a totally other different topic. Last night I was on Jack Allen's show, and we had brought up he had brought up the idea: would it be a good thing or a bad thing if a country was all one religion? And I, this is a perfect example. And I said, unfortunately, I think it could be a very dangerous thing, because now you get somebody, if they, you, they just manipulated half, fifty-five percent of the Christians or Catholics in that country. What if they did that here? If the whole country is Catholic, you can manip- You know what I'm saying? It's just very oh, right. dangerous. Right. I think you know if you look at it that way. I'm just saying that's yeah. very dangerous to do that. It's interesting though because most that's, of Vietnam is Buddhist, like uh, William. Well, was it's because you moved them all out. You moved out all the. I Catholics. guess, yeah, that's true, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah, it's wild. Yeah, Lansdale masqueraded as the assistant U.S. Air Attaché in Saigon while leading a covert group that specialized in psychological warfare. So. Mm. I'm still Sorry to keep interrupting you about him. I just find him to be so interesting. And like nobody, nobody really talks about him. He's like almost the Aquino before the Aquino, you know, before Michael Aquino. And I think the guy who was assassinated before Kennedy was DM. I think that was his his last name. He was a Catholic too, so he, he wasn't uh, as you know connected to as many to the to the Buddhists. Yeah, he was killed in second November, nineteen sixty three, and then Kennedy was twenty second of November. Oh wow! Yeah. Close to each other. It's interesting too. So, like, I think that the the operation to get Kennedy probably started six months before. So, I think it started sometime in sixty three is when the wheels started turning. I've talked to Corey Hughes about that, and there's just certain indicators that show that that they were trying to get Oswald into place. And trying to get these these people into the right spots to have a patsy. I think they're always going to. And they had patsies all throughout the 60s. That was kind of their technique um, for when it's like a huge social thing. Like I, somebody asked me, who did did the CIA do the Kennedy assassination? And I, my answer was, I think they all did. There were so many different people involved and so many different people angry. The elites, the anti-Castro Cubans who, were, who survived the Bay of Pigs were all very incentivized. And we're all causing trouble for decades after uh, 19, well, the Bay of Pigs, I think it was 61. So then the, the intelligence people involved in that, the, uh, the CIA, which is very much elite, uh, seated with a kind of American aristocracy. And then the far right, Johnson wanted him gone. Johnson was in a bad spot. So then you threw in all the Texas and Kit Cavell, who's the mayor of Texas. His brother was high in the CIA. So you've got coverage there. Um, so I think this, the JFK operation, the Intel operation was, uh, going in this, you know, moving. And I think there were, there were other shots. I think some, there was a plan to get him in Chicago and also in Miami. So I think oh, that wow. there were other precursors. Yeah. There was a guy like Oswald that somebody else studied in, um, the JFK things. And this is part of the high weirdness where he was like the same kind of cutout. Like Oswald was aggressive and made statements and they made him look like a communist, like fair play for Cuba. And he was being handled the whole time. He was, you know, there's an FBI agent that's covered in JFK, the movie, but there was another guy like Oswald in Chicago. And, uh, so I think that Oswald didn't know he was so young. He was in the midst of just incredible things as this very young person. When he died and shot was shot by Jack Ruby, he was only 24. So. Wow. But yeah. So yeah. So Lansdale, uh, yeah, Lansdale and that, probably there managing it, managing and managing the psychological operation of the thing, you know, and somebody has gone in Joseph McBride, who I interviewed was old enough to remember it. Like, and he, his family was friends with Kennedy. So, 
I think that he, for him, that did like I was born in 68, so it wasn't a personal event, but for McBride it was. And he remembered the full four days, right? So he sees it as JFK, Oswald gets shot in two days or two days later. And then there's funerals for Tippett, JFK, who was a cop who was killed. Tippett, JFK, and Oswald all in the same day. So they had it all wrapped up, man. They had it all wrapped up in four days. And you got to remember the media that back in those days was only three big channels, ABC, CBS, NBC. And they showed it. So it was almost like a, I wouldn't even say maybe ritual, a ritual, but ritualized. We have the killing of the king. Look at how sad this is. Let's get his wife out here. Done. Some, moved on. Johnson's next. Sometimes I think like even like, you know, the Twin Towers. I mean, I guess, I mean, just with the technology we have, it's just inevitable. You'll see something if it's horrible, if it's huge enough. But like sometimes I do think like back in the day, televising that stuff in a sense was just a way to traumatize people visually too. Right. Or put them into a state of fear at least. You know, I do Absolutely. think. I think I you're right. Think. And they were trying to make it a real communist. Like at that time, uh, uh, Oswald was a communist, right? So that was the, the whole thing. It's communism is bad. Look at this communist revolution. Oh, well, that's what Lansdale was using as an excuse to do everything right. that he was doing. It was the communists. Right. You see that theme, right? Yeah. So I saw I was talking about Russia. Russia is the good yeah. enemy. Got to get these bad yeah, colonies. He was Even though we're China. invading and overthrowing governments all over the world. And the state is getting bigger. And yeah. So, I mean, I think that that's that psychological. Funny. That's part of the MK Ultra. People make a mistake of saying the MK Ultra was really just about finding a mind controlled assassin, which was part of it. But it was also about. The real goal that was set up by Dulles right here in 53 was control of the civilian population through whatever means, drugs, propaganda, black propaganda, everything. So they they were playing and trying to – I would think that was an element of the JFK assassination that's overlooked by a lot of those researchers is that component, the psychological story. So the narrative of the entire JFK operation from – the shooting to like the blame and how to get the whole public on board with that. Cause I think at the time, most people just believed that Oswald did it. I mean, now I don't think that it's a minority that really just believes that story. I think the majority knows like they've, the scales have come from their eyes, so to speak. They've, they understand like, okay, these pieces fit together in this puzzle in a different way. It's not Oswald. And if you, I mean, it doesn't make sense for Oswald to wait. If you watch like how JFK on the on the parade route, he went through this main street of um, Dallas, right? He was traveling. It would be towards Dealey Plaza. It would be roughly south. I don't know if it's directly south, but he goes to Dealey Plaza, takes a right, and heads directly towards the book depository, then takes a left, and drop, it's, it's downhill to an underpass, and that's supposedly where Oswald shot him. Like, he was in the worst place to shoot. He had a clear angle. If he was supposedly on the sixth floor depository, you can go up there and see this fake history. It shows you how much of American history is fake. You can see this <laughs> fake history. But you can, if you just imagine yourself looking down, it was a perfect shot. It was a turkey shoot. He's literally driving the car straight at you. You wouldn't have had to even adjust for anything. If you were a good shot, it doesn't make any sense. So that's just one of the party parts of the story that's complete. Have you ever oh, heard about, you know, I wanted to ask you actually your, your opinion on, on Oswald. Uh, and real quick, I, I want to ask you if you've ever heard of, um, I think it was called the Council of Nine. It was like some group of people that channeled stuff. And I think somebody somehow, sister in that group, somebody was tied to Oswald. <laughs> Knew who Oswald was. Yeah. And they're just like, how do these connections start happening? But uh, if it, you just no, know it gets if very, very strange. <laughs> Oswald, his whole his history is very like they're moving somebody around. I think he was lovingly curated. I think that he was curated for a very long time because there's a very early picture of him in. He had a connection to um, New Orleans, and so there's pictures of him. There's there's pictures of him with that weird pedophile guy that was in the movies played by Joe Pesci. I forgot his name offhand, but there's pictures of him in this air brigade at 15. So he's around very sus people at that time. And that guy, whose name I can't remember, he's a real character. He had alopecia, so he had no hair on his body. He looks very strange. And he was a known pedophile. That's why he got kicked out of the priesthood. But he was also involved in hypnotism. So he was involved in kind of mind control. He was uh, like a kind of new, maybe a new ager or a cultist type. He had been a Catholic priest. 
David Ferry? Um, is that David Ferry, thanks. Yeah. Someone, oh, you, Carl okay. and DK Wilson. Oh, all right. Thanks for looking that up through. real quick. I was like, damn. <laughs> thanks, guys. My memory. It wasn't me. Yeah. Uh, David Ferry was there. So that's 15. So he's surrounding these guys who were involved in, in. David Ferry was a pilot who was ferrying drugs. It's a perfect name. And he died suspiciously, too. But he's really good. Uh, Pesci's really good in that in JFK. So he was there at 15. And then this weird Ruth Payne person. And the nine connection is that her husband worked for Bell Helicopter in one of the prime beneficiaries of the war in Vietnam because they ordered those uh, huge allotments of helicopters. Now right, we're back to Bell. Vietnam or Lansdale. Right, right. <laughs> uh, but let's get this. So his name, I forgot her husband's name. Ruth Payne's husband's stepfather was a guy by the name of Arthur M. Young who was a total kind of uh, frontline intellectual new age type who founded the Institute for the Study of Consciousness and was in seances by Andrea Puharich. Yes, so that, that was, was the name. nine, and that's the connection to the weird nine. And so one of those people knew, uh, seemed to know Oswald. Like, Oswald was so strange. Like, how could he go to Russia, stay there, and come back? It just doesn't, especially at kind of the height of the Cold War, too. Like, he, his true his history is so odd in Atsugi. And this Carrie Thornwood, there's, like I said earlier, very high strangeness in the JFK assassination. And get this, so I think the beginning of the curation of Oswald took place, and this is in that book I mentioned, it did not start with JFK, um, was when Oswald's dad died when he was very young, so he just had a single mom. But he was in a kind of reformatory boys' school and was involved, involved with this guy named George C. White at like early teens. And George C. White was conducting experiments like these. This was the MK Ultra era. If you do the timelines and you overlap these timelines, the, the, it becomes very in, interesting because George C. White would later go on to do what was known as Operation Midnight Climax, which was he would rent these apartments in San Francisco and I think New York and surreptitiously drug people with LSD and study them without their knowledge. Oh, it was very, yeah, yeah okay. no informed consent, now. right? Wow. No informed consent. So he would drug them and study them and bring in prostitutes. And White was a known kind of hardball baller, like, like a street intel thug, not one of the intellects who's sitting on like a desk, you know, uh, reading books all day. But White was a, like a field agent and drank like a full bottle of scotch a day, like that type of person. Look up George C. Wright. See right on the internet and pull up his information. So that guy has an, a, a connection to Oswald at a, as a teen. So you go from George C. White to David Ferry, known Intel underground stuff, uh, pedophile, to Ms. Ruth Payne, who's like the same thing. Like she has Intel written all over her. She She's a Forbes, like the Forbes magazine. She has a relationship to the Forbes. And they had, her husband had like a huge trust fund for back in the day. Like at that time, I think it was five hundred thousand dollars, which would take you a long way. And here she is in Irving, Texas, in this very humble, like house that today would probably be like a couple hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, if it was for sale. It's just so so all this stuff doesn't make sense. Plus, she's a psychologist, right? So she has a psychology degree, and that movie is really interesting. If people go see the assassination assassination of Miss Payne, I would recommend people see that documentary because she's much more variegated. She has more facets to her life because later on after the JFK assassination, people said she was involved in left-wing politics, but they got really sussed out by her because she was taking pictures without people's authorization. So they caught her taking like secret pictures. Like, I mean, imagine if you're at some party and somebody's secretly taking pictures of you, like, why would she be doing that? So I think she was really tied into the kind of Eastern, uh, elite that really i think that uh, really moved against kennedy at a certain point and i think that's really that's really how he had to go after i think um after bay of pigs and then kind of his ideas of detente with uh, russia and then going around people like he was doing these whole negotiations with khrushchev through a third party not going through the state department but negotiating during the missile crisis in 62 through like a friend of a friend. You have to, it's unbelievable. Like the world's on the line. We could have nuclear war and JFK is not trusting his underlings enough to actually have them negotiate 
uh, with Khrushchev. So that was, must have just made people insane with anger, you know? Mm. Like he's doing an end around. So well, anyway. I was going to ask, like, this might be a really ignorant question, but I think not being American, like I'm Canadian, so it, it's not like as much in our psyche, like the importance or significance of the Kennedy assassination. But I was going to ask, like, what do you think was like, the reason why he was assassinated or obviously there was like multiple reasons and it just tripped me up because in research like kennedy is one of the illuminati bloodlines so it's like was he not like supposed to be president you know that's a really good question i think that um he was he just kind of went his own route he went rogue so he mm-hmm. didn't he didn't take the line of just going with the way things go like uh, Obama did. Yeah. We'll just keep the CIA. Instead, he was like trying to actually be president. So I think Mm -hmm. he was talked about getting rid of the CIA. He was against this kind of imperial war. He was more liberal. Um, And I think that they, you know, I think that these things that have that he wasn't on board with this kind of like what had happened in the past decade, which was just the predominance of American uh, economic and military power on the world. Like nothing, the world has never seen anything like that. It really is like almost a Roman empire for the world, but they were just go overthrowing people of Mumba left and right. Masadeg, our bands like, um, and it continued. So I think that uh, Kennedy wasn't on board with that. And those were the people he's, who made him angry. And I think that the Bay of pigs, like he didn't support the, the state or the deep state at that time. And I think those are the people who turned on him. So, yeah, but maybe he was supposed to be like their man, like their puppet, and he just kind of did his own thing. I'm not I really would sure. assume that there was just certain things about the Kennedys that were not in the mainline American tradition. So mm. you had the American tradition was Protestants. I don't think there was ever a Catholic until Kennedy, and they were Irish. Um, so they're not like from that elite, even though they part went, you know, went to great universities and were well educated. I think they were just a little on their own. So they may not have gone to the same clubs. I don't know if they were really accepted into that kind of Eastern aristocracy elite, those clubs and stuff like that. So I think that that just kind of, it just perpetuated himself. So it wasn't like things were handled in in front. Like I'm going to fire you. And I think that that's, they made a lot of enemies. The Kennedys were, uh, had tons of enemies. So Mm -hmm. I think that they probably gave him a test. Like this is the way, you know, see how things go. And then somebody went, things are going really bad after the missile crisis and after the Bay of Pigs, or it's really the Bay of Pigs and then the missile crisis. So I think that's what led up somebody somewhere in some club. Like it wasn't at the CIA. Somebody just, everybody was angry. People were talking about killing Kennedy openly. There were like things, you know, uh, people were very angry. And the, uh, the America was much different at that time, too. Like, their civil rights didn't really exist until the 60s. So he was talking about civil rights, too. He gave a famous civil rights speech. He gave that speech at American University about the monolithic nature of, like, why did he talk about the monolith? But he seemed to be pointing out kind of the secret society and uh, speech. And, mm, interesting. So I think that, and you can follow those last year, that last year of his life, he was just, it seems like everything he did would antagonize people, like the speeches (laughs) he's given, and then like trying to have peace with people of different ethnicities. Was he, was he a Trump before Trump? (laughs) It's a good question. Kind of similar a little bit in some ways, not all the ways, of course, but. I have to give Trump credit for some of his other stuff. He really did cross and has always crossed to his credit kind of ethnic racial boundaries. He's always, he had tons of like on his last campaign where they still, I'm not not supposed to say that the suspicious (laughs) thing that happened where Biden supposedly got 81 million votes. Right. (laughs) He had like half of this thing where African Americans, he was actively as a politician should trying to get people on board with him. Like he had tons of like black people on stage and, and always um, had that to his credit. So I think that, in that sense, he was probably a lot like the Kennedys who were like that too. Um, and just kind of unpredictable, I would say. Yeah, I think, I, you know, Trump, and then you say that, like he, Trump is a lot like Kennedy in the sense that he's kind of a borough guy. He didn't come from these wealthy families or Rockefeller ties. Like if you look at the at the whole death of Kennedy, the people all around them had tons of like Rockefeller ties, Rockefeller um, foundation ties, like uh, McCloy, 
and uh, the, like the Dulles brothers, like these are a different group. Even the Bushes are totally Rockefeller. Um, but um, so I think that Trump is a lot like that. He didn't have, he didn't really have any power base to rely on. He had to go back to these old Republican parasites to help him run his administration. He didn't have, he didn't have a network that some of these other guys do through the club uh, foundation slash old line family things where you could just, you know, insert your own people or, or like one of the things about Bush, a very, I mean, very sinister character to me, Bush senior is he always cultivated these personal relationships. That was very important to him and helped in all of those administrations. So we could have people rely on him. We just do what he did and he could insert them into these admin, huge administrative bodies, wherever they were. And I think that Trump didn't have that. I don't think Kennedy had that either. Interesting. Yeah, I wanted to ask you before, um, actually there's a couple of things I wanted to bring up with JFK. Uh, with, uh, I guess back to Oswald, I've often, like, do you, do you, what's your opinion on, like, would you think it's possible that he might have been, like, MK ultrad, Or, like, was he That's a great question. being used and, like, I mean, he, they could have literally given him the gun and let him actually even pop off around, but weren't required, weren't requiring him to make it happen. Like, already had their own thing going, regardless if he hit him or not. Who knows, but... I definitely think he was used to blame, but you think he was like kind of like psycho psychologically fucked with too. Programmed to kill. Yeah, or programmed <laughs> to think that's what he's doing. You know what I'm well, saying? Well, let's go let's look at the sixties, right? Let's look at the the sixties and some of these other people. Let's look at the death of Martin Luther King. And then let's also look at the death of his brother, RFK. Really good book on RFK by Lisa Peace. P-E-A-S-E, who I've interviewed, and you can go back and look oh, at that. Yeah, talks about Sirhan Sirhan. Um, Sirhan Sirhan, without a doubt, was an mk person. He did not shoot Robert F. Kennedy. Robert F. Kennedy had a shot between, and his son doesn't even think of Rob, Bobby Kennedy was around. Robert F. Kennedy would, had a gun within like two or three inches of the back of his head. That was the kill shot. It was a headshot. All headshots, by the way. Like, these are people who want to get rid of people, right? Um so Sirhan Sirhan, and I've talked to Lisa Peace, and it's kind of interesting. There's interesting parallels between the death of RFK and JFK. And, uh, so RFK took place in L.A., Ambassador Hotel, which is totally wiped out. It's like a high school now. But the, she thinks that there were teams in different parts of that Ambassador Hotel with their own killer and Patsy to get whatever way out of the ambassador hotel he was going to go, which is really crazy. So there was a kill team downstairs. There was one in the pantry. Um, but so just using that for an example. So he's an MK, the killer of Martin Luther King. Um, this is a Nelson book. So I, these are books. If you put them together, it's pretty interesting, but I highly recommend all these authors piece and uh, Philip F. Nelson book is, who really killed Martin Luther King, the case against Lyndon Baines Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover. The guy who supposedly killed him, right? Full MK. Total mystery. Easily hypnotized, just like Sirhan Sirhan. Um, let out of, suspiciously let out of Jefferson County Prison before the MLK assassination. Has weird memories. Talks to a guy named Raul. Sirhan Sirhan talking to a guy called Radio Man, right? And writing weird, mysterious stuff. Really good video by Chase, Hugh, Chase Hughes on the subject of uh, Radio Man, a guy wow, who loves gave your old science. Two fully MK'd killers, patsies. Uh, does, these guys don't remember. Go watch them. They're all like blank stares and stuff. So then get to Oswald. I talk about George White uh, being curated and handled. Oswald had strange rages. Like he, he was known to be violent. He beat up Marina and what they would do is put him in front of like a TV where he would just sit there and watch TV. That's was his, that was his, how he relaxed or whatever. Watch TV. Where did they find Oswald in front of a movie theater? He was in a movie screen, right? So he's just sitting there watching TV watching the thing. And, and, and he might've been highly suggestible. And that's the whole psych psych connection between Payne and Oswald is they, put Oswald with somebody who knew about child psychology. At least that was her degree, but at least she knew psychology. And so you see this 
element in all of these 60s killings. These are all MK8. Yeah, probably. And Oswald probably is my guess. It's a really good question. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if they were doing it back then, that really makes me wonder with like a lot of these mass shootings. <laughs> I, I would be very suspicious. This guy who did the Buffalo shooting where he walked in and killed a bunch of black people, he drove all the way there. He had like a so-called ex-FBI handler. Um, you look at Crimo, this guy who dressed as a woman, he had the smiley face. I mean, these are they're picking up some of this culture from somewhere. And if you go back, I mean, these are really strange events, but if you go back to when Jeffrey Epstein got arrested, there was a spate of, of mass shootings. There was one in Gilroy at the Garlic Festival. And they asked the guy, why are you doing this? He said, I, I don't know. And then they shot him. But it was like these were like, this is like the MK big picture, the big screen picture where you have events taking away from other events. You don't want people covering this event. You get the shooter out there, you know, everybody's going to cover that. So those are distractions. They're deflections. And I think that when, go back and look at the, the shootings and that coincide with the Epstein connect, much bigger thing than people realize because Epstein blackmailed everyone. <laughs> so they were very nervous people. That's why they're not busting anybody because it was probably the entire American political, economic, and entertainment system. Look there at all the people who their islands. There would be nobody <laughs> left. There would just be just like people like you and me just. So I think that they got Epstein was uh, and Epstein and, and his handlers and uh, Ghislaine and who was really running him, who they think. Is, I mean, you have to look at you have to look at Ghislaine's dad, who basically played games with Intel. Like she was he. Uh, what is real? His name, real name was Abraham Laszlo. That was his real given name. But, you know, he went to Robert Maxwell. But he was working with the KGB with MI6 or MI5 in the UK had Intel connections here. He was just a very comfortable in that environment. Obviously Masad. he was very comfortable in the Intel community. And so I think that this, his daughter was like that too. Do you think, what do you she think was a triple about his, quadruple agent? His death. I and mean, you think that was even real fake to uh, something weird behind it? It was very fortunate for him because he was very much in financial trouble. He had uh, just looted like the pension funds. Um, but it would have been it would have been very elaborate because his body was taken. His daughter was there. She said at the time like they killed him, and he was buried in Jerusalem as like a Jew, um, Jewish burial. Uh, and I think it was like five or six of the all of the living prime ministers who were still alive went to his funeral as a credit. So he was involved in so much stuff for oh, Israel yeah. for the Jewish. I mean, he was really. I think he was fighting for. Jewish interests. Uh, was, oh, his whole, like his whole family was massacred. There's a really bad. I mean, he, he's this, he's like bawling about all his family, like on this uh, memorial for the Holocaust. Like his whole family was murdered. So, I would say he was very motivated. And then uh, I did want to ask you. I know we brought it up earlier too, and you mentioned Bush. Um, you know, I, there is things about Bush supposedly with JFK assassination and. Uh, you know, if him and Lance there were both there at the same time or both in the same area, that is very interesting, you know. Again, like you were saying, you think there could have been multiple people in on it or, you know, multiple facets. So, I mean, do you think Bush, because uh, you were saying, now I, I know I've seen a picture of him standing in front of a door or a building that's supposed to be somewhere close to it. Now, I don't know if it was where you said 10 miles away or not. but <laughs> And then I even I wonder, agree. this thing that he supposedly spoke at, who was there? Was it open to the public? And how many people were there? You know, maybe maybe it never even happened, you know, but it was just right. an appointment that he supposedly had. But uh, do you think anything is possible with him as well? I mean, because now you have two CIA agents that are both known for, like, not giving a shit about anybody. <laughs> right. I mean, I think Bush Sr. was a really kind of like the ultimate kind of operator. Um, but... I think he was 10 miles away, according to his wife. There was a, an oil meeting, which would coincide with these other things that were happening in, happening in Texas prior to the death, which was meetings of Johnson with the Murchison brothers, big oil guys. So maybe there's an overlap between these oil people. And, and Bush is an oil guy, right? Uh, he had uh, this company called Black Goo. Zapata, Zapata <laughs> Oil. So they, the family is very much tied into the Texas oil Thing. So it would make sense for him to be there to make sure nothing went wrong. And there's supposedly a picture of him in front of the 
school depository. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. But, I mean, it looks kind of like him. He's hunched over. I mean, that's kind of was like the gate of Bush, too. So Lansdale and similar people saw the same thing. But uh, it would make perfect sense. Like, he wasn't even acknowledged as a CIA agent at that time. I think he was only acknowledged until, uh, when he became head of the CIA in, what, the 70s? So, but he was tied in. That family's tied in with the Rockefeller brothers, David. I mean, all the Rockefeller brothers were very influential. David, Nelson, Lawrence. Um, but yeah, so I think that's it. And that's covered a really good book is called family of secrets. I forgot the author now, but he goes in detail with him, his relationship with DeMorne Schild, who is kind of another, uh, Oswald handler, um, who, who goes, who floats around this whole case who died. Like a lot of people died on the, when they, when the, when the Congress started investigating these assassins, uh, the assassinations of the sixties and the seventies, people were called in to testify and they died and DeMorne Schild was one of them. Another one was a couple of mobsters died or were found in 50 gallon drums. So they didn't want some of these people to give their testimony from the under, but um, that's why I think kind of like people, the CIA did it. Well, it's a much broader, broader mm-hmm. social movement. And I, I don't think Kennedy, the Kennedys had, like I said, I mean, there were certain power bases they had, but they didn't have anything like that. The right that time. And the right was very uh, aggressive. There were some very aggressive, white supremacists and things going on at that time. Um, it's, it's interesting. And I think you bring that up. Yeah. Corey Hughes, Corey Hughes said like he got some pictures of these guys had these uh, things on their shirts that were clearly KKK. Like the KKK still had juice or power back then. Maybe it has underground power now, but like people in that, in the Dealey Plaza are clearly showing off their KKK affiliations. You know, that's actually something I want to cover eventually because I actually think that the symbolism and all this stuff is very occult. I mean, to me, it almost just looks like another order. I don't. It's very interesting. The KKK. What's very occult? The KKK. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, but it was started by um, the guy who was a Mason. It was started by oh, see, Albert. Yeah. I, I just yeah. just from looking at this so that's stuff, a KKK thirty three thirty three oh, eleven okay, eleven. Yeah. All the numbers are there, right? Yeah, because I know for a while I've been I've been saying that that I've wanted to cover it. Just from looking at this stuff, I was like, oh shit, this should be an easy one, you know, if I just dig around. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I Albert wanted... Pike's association with KKK is is established. Um, I think a question I had, um, maybe your opinion on it. Uh, I had often tossed around the idea if, um, not denying that guy's dead. Uh, he probably is JFK or he is by now anyway, if, if, even if that was fake, but I mean, I'm taking, you know, it really I don't think anything's fake on JFK. Yeah. yeah I no, I'm saying- they, <laughs> they set him up for the worst guy. He was very, not very well. He had Addison's disease. He was taking drugs. He had, was doc, Dr. Feelgood was around. He was known to be getting drugs from like Leary and they could have just poisoned him or did something. They mm-hmm. wanted to make a statement. That's why they blew his head off in public. Like, and that was, uh, I think that was a conclusion of an earlier JFK researcher who's passed away, but it always has stuck with me. His name was Vincent Salandria. And he said, that's why they structured it. They wanted to let everybody know who's, who's in power and not to cross them. Yeah. Well, what I was thinking and this this is probably out there. It's like kind of like really conspiratorial. But I was like really wondering if, because like you started like around that time, it started getting very much with like the hippie movement. And a few years later, he was very much of a liberal president, like you even said before. Could that have been like a push to get sympathy for the left? Because I hate to say it, after his death, that's when all this liberal shit really starts popping off. That's true. Um, I think that there was probably like a, uh, a re- I think the Vietnam War really set off a lot of that stuff. People wanted to drop out. Yeah. Leary was kind of a Pied Piper, tune in, drop in, drop out or whatever. So I think that it, a lot of these were maybe structured social movements or encouraged. The hippie movement was new in the U.S. Yeah. and was studied by MKL do- doctors, uh, Jolly and West. Actually went oh, and like lived You were mentioning in LSD a- before. I'm sure they were pumping it into those people. <laughs> yeah, he knew about LSD because he killed a uh, elephant with it. So I think he's just one. The the thing is, is that these are huge operations. Like he's just one figure, and these so many other oh. other doctors were um, corrupted by CIA MK Ultra money. He, I think, he was one of them, in my opinion. But um, I think that that there's a lot of social engineering going on in the '60s. Um, a lot of these bands and things like that. There's intel people behind them. Yeah. There's occultism. Leary was definitely saying he was carrying on the tradition of Aleister Crowley. 
Like that's a very strange thing to say from a kind of academic who was working at Harvard. Um, I mean, there's plenty of so, bands that I can even say I still listen to. I liked when I was a kid, but I listen to their stuff now and I see what they were doing back then. Like the Grateful I, Dead. I mean, come on. I, I can't deny that. Like they no, were somehow I mean, involved with pumping LSD into people. I'm sorry to say it, right. but I still like yeah, their music. Yeah. Unfortunately, some of it, you know, see that's, I didn't know about the dead. I was surrounded by the dead. Actually, when I was growing up, I used to drive their cars. I was a valet at a higher end hotel. And so they would stay there and take over the whole top floor. Uh, but I didn't really listen to their music. I didn't have an a, a affinity, but I knew people who did in that area in Northern California. I'm actually having on, Carl Hassel, who's in the chat right now, he's going to talk about his uh, knowledge of uh, the Grateful Dead and their that's, social media. The guy, Mickey Harder, right. one of them was going to the Bohemian Club. Uh, they have the lightning bolt motif, and some of their lyrics are heavy. But oh, yeah. They are yeah. definitely engineered. They're definitely yeah. kind of, there's an intel. <laughs> that I mean, I'm sure Woodstock, there was people you yeah. know, there to hand out drugs, I'm sure. On purpose. Right, I think it was part of the social movement, and I think that's part of the MK Ultra has tried to drug people out as, as a form of uh, taking the teeth out of the populace, right? If you're in the head and you're trying to have this war, what do you want? You want people to drop out and not complain. And so many of the it's, bands Especially if you're making then, money. Like uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, the, the Doors, you know, uh, the Grateful Dead, they all have, like, ties to, like, military and shit like that in their family or somehow. You know, or they've been there themselves. And it's just like, you know, what's the coincidence after a while? All these people that are looked at as like, you know, oh, you got to get high to listen to their stuff. You know, all of them all have these contacts or they're all by Laurel Canyon. You know, something weird right. like that. It's just like. That's Dave McGowan, right? Weird scenes. Go read that book. All Intel yeah. stuff are all old money. Like, uh, I think one of the guys from Crosby. Crosby was a Van Cortland who was like a big time. Uh, rich old New York family. There's actually a Van Cortland Park in uh, New York where some of the Sons of Sam stuff went always down. Mean, always comes back. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, the '60s is is very important to unpack. I think there's a lot of thing that things that happen, but yeah. I think it's all important to see in the context of the JFK is like what happened leading up, what happened after. Look, look at the changes, the Vietnam War. We kind of like, oh, we, we lost 50,000 people. For Southeast Asia, that was an apocalyptic, genocidal hellscape, you know. They lost like 2 million people in Vietnam. Vietnam was torn up. There were mass bombings. They bombed more. They dropped more bombs in Southeast Asia than the U.S. dropped in World War II. So they, they was totally illegal. They were bombing Laos. They were bombing Cambodia. Um, so... Yeah, have you ever God, seen that movie fast. Apocalypse Now? I'm sure you've seen that. Yeah, right? of, course, of course. I have often wondered in that movie that guy that like went rogue at the end. I mean, besides him probably losing his mind and just being crazy, um, I, I do think like even in little snippets of things that he says, he's like, I think he came across and realized that there was a lot of screwed up shit going on, and even him and other people were being used as a part of it. Right. it like you kind yeah, of see little that's... snippets of him kind of dropping that, even if you, if you, I don't know if. You remember one of the craziest parts. He's talking about how in at one point him and his troops had to go inoculate all these kids. And they go and inoculate all of them and they're walking back to their stuff and parents come running back with their chopped off arms. Why are you including that in the movie? There's something that you were trying to get at with that. Were you even telling us then the vaccinations are used as a weapon? The oh, parents wow. knew and that's why they chopped off their fucking arms because they'd rather the kid live and just have one arm. Because he even said the genius in them being able to do that That's blew right. his mind. Because at that point, as a parent, you had to do the most gruesome thing, but you knew it was to keep your child alive. That blew his mind that someone, someone was capable of doing that. And I do think that he's, he, in that movie, that's even showing us that there was fucked up shit going on. Psyops. Yeah, wasn't abused. his name? Yeah, right. No, very <laughs> dark stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, but wasn't he based upon uh, Heart of Darkness? That book oh, wasn't know. Kurtz based upon it the Heart was, of Darkness it was character? based on a real person. And what's even crazier is that if people, if anybody's watched that movie, when you see that cow get killed, that's actually real because they went out and got real religious people in that religion that do that. So when they did it, it was considered religious and they were allowed to show it on the screen. So you're actually watching a real cow mutilation mm -hmm. in that fucking movie, too. Oh. That was crazy. When is, I found that, that out, so I was like, yo, you went extra hard for that, dude. Like, yeah. <laughs> Dennis Hopper has real serious uh, occult ties, Crowley ties too. 
Oh, he's, he's out of his mind. That guy's shot. You get the, yeah, he's got to be. Yeah, I mean, he's passed away, but he was in this movie, Night Tide, with uh, Jack Parsons' wife. <laughs> it's incredible. He was in uh, Texas Look Chainsaw up. Massacre, too. <laughs> was he? I didn't know yeah. that. He's... he's <laughs> He's uh, a little bit more interesting. I've got to look into his background because he's kind of in an infamous picture for me where he's sitting a lot around with Kenneth Anger, Alejandro Jodorowsky, and Donald Camel, all, all literal Crowley, like, followers. Oh, for sure, Kenneth Anger. And Donald Camel sat, literally sat on Crowley's knee. So they're all there in this picture with... Uh, with Dennis Hopper. Let me see if I can find that. Well, it's weird. Um, Apocalypse Now is produced by Francis Ford Coppola and did The Godfather. And then you have the horse <laughs> scene and then the cow oh, wow, at the same yeah, time. Yeah, Both yeah, real. Like I think the horse they got from a butcher shop. So wow. it, was, it was a real horse's head in the bed. Oh, you like yeah. yeah. See, this is what I'm getting at. It's just weird. Like, why do you, you know, you went extra hard to make that happen to put the real stuff on the screen. I don't know. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just weird to me. I don't know. Very weird. <laughs> uh, do you have any uh, questions, uh, Teresa, for Ramsey? Um, actually, there was a question in the chat from Jonah. Um, he wanted to know, uh, William, if you've ever heard of Project Orion in relation to school shootings. No, it sounds familiar, though. Okay. I don't I've know. Heard of that. This yeah, picture is in my book, Children of the Beast. It's such an important picture. If you know these guys, the only person I don't really have all the information on is Hopper, but Camel's right there on the left. He did this movie called, oh, I forgot it now. It had Mick Jagger in it. Alejandro Jodorowsky, Holy Mountain, and Kenneth Anger, Lucifer Rising. He's got, Anger's totally involved, uh, close to Manson. He's actually good friends and lived with uh, Bobby Boussoulet. Uh This Alejandro Jodorowsky, guess who his good friend is? Kanye. Kanye no. West. Go look at that picture. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, he, actually, Kanye borrowed a lot of his imagery, is my understanding. And what? this guy, offici <laughs> he officiated at the wedding of Marilyn Manson. And then Camel was good friends with Marlon Brando, was his best friend. And uh, he made all kinds of strange uh, cult movies. What was the name of Donald Camel's movie? Oh, this is this is Jodorowsky. He's playing the alchemist. Get that. You'd probably take that apart. Uh, there's, oh, there's, wow. There's a hopper, yeah. Anyway, really strange, uh, strange sure. connections. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, one more thing. I just thought that was weird. And going back to when I was bringing up uh, Trump and JFK being connected. Do you think, um, William, that, that has something to do with like Q now or like the Q operation? I always kind of got the sense that Q was some kind of uh, psychological operation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if it's military. I don't know if it's run by the U.S. government or just somebody in politics. Yeah, or maybe like that. a long tail. <laughs> it might be. I mean, it's been very effective. Oh, it's yeah. been some people are true Q believers. When they they actually had the statement through Q that JFK Jr. was going to show up at Dealey Plaza, and they you they went and took a picture, and there were like hundreds and hundreds of people there. They literally believe that JFK Jr. is going to come back. They really they, they talk about it, and some of them really believe it. They really believe all the stuff, adrenochrome. Um, you know, the first thing that Q ever wrote is that Hillary Clinton is going to be arrested, and that never happened. So that should give, make Still you waiting. suspicious. Yeah, so no, I, mentioned, I mentioned it last night, and then, and then we'll wrap it up, uh, William. Uh, I was I was on Jack Allen's show, and I think they were talking. We were just going to start talking about like what's going on, like you know, in the news or just you know, current events. And I said, well, according to uh, to Instagram on a Q account that follows me. I said that I guess I'm following back. Uh, right now, they're actually having tribunals, and that's what's not, you know, it's not Congress that's having a problem. Everybody's getting arrested. <laughs> I was like, you know, I was like, I had to unfollow it. I sound like an asshole, but I'm sorry. That's just, how do you believe in saying shit like that? But imagine what somebody <laughs> could do knowing that you believe that. Like, that's these are dangerous. Tests. The same thing happens in, sci in Scientology. They're testing to see if you will agree to that. Something oh, like you that. Can do those. And then it's like, hey, Zenu's here. Give me all your money. So once oh. people are on board with Q, you know that they're they're suggestible. Like, they're, like mm. they may be testing people for suggestibility because an average critical I thinker is like, this is complete garbage. Come on. Where's the proof? Because really. They were saying on Q, didn't they say on Q that there were like 20,000 unsealed indictments and stuff? Yes. 
<laughs> David like Wilcox was point. saying that before Q even came out, so that's how I knew that shit was bullshit. <laughs> have you seen the court? Have you seen the Corey Good? Um, yes, I was so Corey. happy to see that. <laughs> we should just do a show of watching on that. He admits everything was fake. <laughs> Yo, I loved it because so, you know one of my favorite parts is that he admits in that <laughs> excuse me deposition that uh, Wilcox made something like four to five million dollars streaming his stuff to you know whatever his his group of suckers are and so that's like probably why he started his whole thing the guy the guy was very imaginative so i have to give him credit he should have and he says it all in my book he should have started off with a book he should have just written science fiction or comics or something yeah right he but probably man. would have gotten farther and had a better reputation if he just did sci-fi <laughs> yeah i think he's in trouble because he can get a re- he can get super fraud if somebody like if all these people paid. Sure. i saw something when i was covering him it was really at the beginning of my podcasting career i did like three shows on him but he at that time got his followers to pay his nine thousand dollar uh moving bill like that's real money like he garnered uh to move to boulder colorado or something so he found enough suckers to like give him that money. God knows how many other, how much other money, you know, he, he got. So I remember one time, I think on one of his own shows, David Wilcox admitted like getting his teeth fixed from his like, you know, <laughs> money. Oh yeah. God. Isn't he I the, was like that isn't cheap if you had to pay for that. <laughs> isn't Wilcox the, the reincarnated uh, oh. prop, sleeping prophet or whatever. I forget who's the guy's name. Uh, that's oh, the sleeping I forget what he said. Somebody in the yeah, chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Oh, but that guy, yeah. That's he's a shot. Um, William, yeah, would, he's you, done. would you like to plug your uh, show again, just in case uh, people... That's William Rams. It's Edgar Casey. I think he's the... Yes, Edgar Casey. Edgar yes, Casey. that's him. Yep. Uh, my, I have over 800 episodes. I'm going to do an episode on The Grateful Dead with Carl. Scheduled for Friday, so people check that out. He was there in that area, Northern Cal, and knows a lot about that stuff. Uh, it's William Ramsey Investigates. You can go back and look at all these cases. I just posted uh, all these shows. I mean, I just posted the shows that I've done about the JFK assassination on, on Twitter. So you can just type those into a search engine nice. and listen along. And I recommend those books, too. And then I've got five books at my website, William Ramsey Investigates, and then five documentaries on Vimeo, William Ramsey. Awesome. Yeah, so everybody go check that out. Links to his stuff is also in the bottom. And Teresa, would you like to uh, plug your show before we close this out? Sure, yeah. So uh, we have another show together called The Spiritual Gangsters. If people haven't listened to it, check it out. It's a little bit of a break from uh, heavy conspiracy and more like personal stories and interesting people. But we always tie it back to the big picture. So I think it's uh, it's a good one. Yes, I definitely enjoyed it. It's definitely a break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the links for that show is in the bottom. Uh, Ramsey's links are in the bottom. My links are in the bottom. Thank you, everybody, for jumping in in on the uh, chat. That might have been the most people I've actually ever seen before. We had at one point 33 people <laughs> in the chat. Yeah, 34 <laughs> right now. Oh, uh, okay. I only have 30 <laughs> now. I saw 33 before, and I was like, oh, God, no. Uh. <laughs> I was like, we need we need another one. Um, so, yeah. So, thank you for everybody who jumped in. DK Wilson, Joe. A child of Ash, what's up, Eric, uh, Helen? I mean, you all know uh, what's up. Uh, I think Arnold might have been in there. A girl. Uh, thank you all for jumping in, and until the next one, everybody, be well. Later. <laughs>